Conversation with the Candidate continues. Welcome back to Conversation with the Candidate and our candidate for president, Congressman Eric Swalwell of California. This is the town hall portion of the conversation. We bring in our New Hampshire voters here who have all the tough questions. Uh, I'm going to fo uh, follow up with some if needed, and we'll have some social media questions Great. as well. But let's get right into it with our first question from Gary Evans. Thank you. Hi, welcome to New Hampshire. <laughs> so the, uh, the New Hampshire House just passed two modest uh, gun control bills, yeah. uh, one for background checks and one for a waiting period. Our um, Republican governor has um, said he's going to veto those bills because um, he doesn't think we need them because we haven't had a mass shooting in New Hampshire. I think New Zealand had that same logic. Um, I'd like to know what, what gun control bills you would like to institute. Well, Gary, uh, nationally. Thank, you, thank you for the question. And I do think this has to be a national conversation. Your state is only as safe as the uh, gun safety laws around you. So you could be a state like California and have some of the toughest laws but if Arizona doesn't require background checks or they allow assault weapons, we have open borders between our states. And so what I'm proposing uh, first is a uh, nationwide background check law. So that's online sales, uh, gun shows, private seller to private buyer. I think we want to make sure that we know whether you have you know, a history of mental illness that would prevent you from uh, safely handling a firearm or if you have any violent uh, history uh, in your past. When it comes to weapons of war, uh, assault rifles uh, in particular, I want to ban and buy back on the 15 million that we have. And I learned as a prosecutor, uh, one of the last cases I tried, uh, we had a young man, he was fired at 40 times, and he was hit just once in the thigh. And his mom asked me at the trial, she said, I, I don't get it. My son Gary, you'd think if you're going to get shot, getting shot in the leg or the arm is where you'd want to get shot. But the autopsy doctor testified that because of the sheer energy from the round, he didn't stand a chance. And so I'd say keep your pistols, keep your long rifles, keep your shotguns. Uh, I respect, uh, you know, the Second Amendment, but some weapons uh, I don't believe belong on our streets. But I also want us to invest in gang prevention programs uh, as well, uh, so that in, in cities like uh, Chicago and Oakland, where we have a lot of shootings and we don't learn about their names or their stories, uh, we understand what's going on there. So there's a lot that we can do. I'm not afraid of the NRA anymore. Good. The moms aren't, the students aren't. They just want us to be safe in our communities. Great. Thank you. Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Next question comes from Kenneth Berlin. Hi, Hi Mr. Berlin. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, as an older aging adult, uh, my question is, what plans do you have to keep Social Security and Medicare solvent? Uh, thank you. What I would do first is raise the cap uh, on Social Security uh, earnings that can uh, that you would pay in. You know, right now uh, at just over $100,000, most Americans stop paying into Social Security. Uh, so I would raise that cap uh, up so that more money would be coming in and it would be uh, solvent beyond just you know 2030. Uh, you know, past 2030, it's not fully funded anymore, and that's something that you worked hard and you paid into. But when it comes to Medicare, uh, what I would do first, uh, I support Medicare for anyone who wants it. That's my health care plan, is a coverage for all plan that would have a government option as well uh, as a public, as well as private insurance if you still want to keep it. And I think by expanding the pool, you could drive down uh, the overall costs. Mm -hmm. But I don't want us to just have a debate about coverage. I want us to find the unfindable, solve the unsolvable, and seek to cure the incurable by making public investments in cures in our lifetime. And so that would mean more investments in data sharing, genomics, and targeted therapies, and seeing that as a way to bring down the cost of care, uh, particularly for a cancer patient, an Alzheimer's patient, a Parkinson's patient. Also, though, extend the quality of life and create a lot of new jobs uh, in the meantime. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Kenneth. Quick follow-up there. Yeah. How do you make health insurance cheaper for those who already have it, if you're going to add that public option? Yeah. So. One, I think with more competition, uh, so one, a bigger pool uh, means that you can truly cover the pre-existing uh, conditions. Uh, but, but second, uh, by, I believe, you know, having more competition on the private insurers, that would also drive down the cost. Now, partially to, to pay for it, I would put back in place the inheritance tax, uh, which the most recent Republican tax bill got rid of. I'd get rid of the corporate tax immunity that exists today for businesses that send jobs overseas. And I also uh, would reduce what we spend on nuclear weapons. Uh, we have spent more on nuclear weapons since 1938, almost 100 times more than we have, for example, on cancer research. And so I think you know, by prioritizing uh, our, health and our health and education uh, over nuclear weapons, 
uh, we could start to make it a lot more affordable. Our next question comes from Paul Kafori, Sr. Hi, Thank sir. you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Paul Kafori. I happen to be a lawyer. Uh, I'm sorry. Apparently, like you, and don't <laughs> please, please don't hold that against me. Um, I've had the opportunity over the years to travel throughout the Middle East, in particular. My question focuses on the Middle East. In light of the extremist right-wing policies of the hard-right Israel Israeli government, what would you do, sir, to promote a just peace? for both the Palestinians and the Israelis? First, I would fire Jared Kushner. He's no longer in charge of our U.S. Middle East policy. And I think it's an insult uh, to a problem, a challenge that we've had for so long that the president would put a family member with no experience on something that really requires uh, you know, thought leaders and people who want a two-state solution. So I, I believe deeply in a two-state solution. Uh, but I also believe that you have to provide economic aid to the Palestinian people. The president took that aid away recently. We need to get back into the UN Commission on Human Rights to make sure that that aid uh, is being spent and that you know, there are human rights both in Israel uh, and on the Palestinian side. I would insist with the Prime Minister of Israel that he has to be serious about a two-state solution and that means no more settlements. I value our relationship with Israel. They are the only true democracy in the Middle East. But until you have two sides that sincerely want a two-state solution, uh, it's not going to happen. And, and so I will be someone uh, who will roll up my sleeves, but also recognize that there are already experts out there that have been working on this, and they'll be put on the job, not people in my family or people who would politically benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And next question comes from George Matthews of Nashua. Hi, George. Hi. Well, I'm a strong progressive. Beating the current occupant of the White House is paramount. How will you distinguish yourself from your fellow Democratic candidates without destroying each other or scaring off the centrist voters? Yeah. I'll be able to take on President Trump as someone who was born in Iowa, educated in the South, married to a Hoosier from Southern Indiana, and elected in one of the most diverse parts of the country. But I'm the first in my family to go to college, so I know why people work hard and what they expect it to add up to. I've got student loan debt myself that I'm paying off, and I'm a father of two kids under two, so I understand the health care challenges people are undergoing. And so the way to beat this president is not to go into the mud with him. I think it's just as I prosecuted 30 some odd cases to a jury, it's just relying on the evidence and not dismissing people who were counting on higher wages, lower health care costs, and a brighter future for their kids, but to dismiss the person who has utterly, utterly failed them. And I'm ready to stand up on that debate stage, make that case, and offer an alternative for the American people. Thank you. Thank you, George. Quick follow there. Yeah. If I read correctly that your father supports President Trump, and now he's going to switch yeah. to you, obviously, yeah. but what's that like? I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I may want to go into the ballot box with him. Um, I'm the son of two Republicans also, and my brothers are police officers. Uh, and you know, I go on Fox News mostly just so they can see me on TV. Um, but my whole life I've been working with Republicans, and I've passed legislation in Congress with Republicans, and I've pledged on day one uh, that I would put together a blended cabinet uh, of Republicans and Democrats. And I may have to send out a search party to find you know, Republicans who will put country over party, but I, I really believe to have credibility to make these reforms our democracy needs, you're going to need a team of rivals. And uh, I, there will be a day after Trump, and I, I think we're going to need a leader uh, who recognizes that and can be a leader for all Americans. Next question comes from social media. This is Michelle Ackley, Alan Newton. She asks, what solutions do you propose to alleviate our immigration crisis? Yeah. Our immigration crisis needs leadership, not showmanship. Right now, it's very easy to go down to the border and say that people who don't look like us, who are fleeing violence and economic despair, are going to take your jobs or commit crimes in our community. That's what the, the president does. He stokes fear. A leader would go beyond the border. A leader would go and work with the leaders of Mexico and, and South American countries to recognize the conditions in Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador are so harsh that you have to understand if someone is leaving that behind to go across a hot desert with little food, little water, little clothing, they must see something better here than where they're leaving. And until we make sure that where they are now in those countries is better, they're going to keep coming here. And so that may mean a Marshall Plan uh, of our lifetime to invest in the economic uh, and opportunity in those countries, but also 
to put the humanitarian resources on our border so that a mom is not separated from her beautiful little baby and that children are not dying in our custody. I also believe I'm a former prosecutor and so if someone is here undocumented and they're committing a violent crime, I think they've got to go and we've got to make it clear. But I've, I've seen across this country that the overwhelming majority of people who have come to our country, they want to just chase that American spirit of working hard, doing better and dreaming bigger. Uh, and if, if that's the case, we should embrace them and distinguish them from those who want to hurt people and get rid of those folks. Next question comes from he Heather Carroll from New Boston. Hi, Heather. Hi, Congressman. Thank you for being here. And um, thank you for taking my question. Of course. Um, if you are elected president, what will you do to stop um, the public health crisis that is Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. And I see you're wearing purple. And we wear purple uh, for Alzheimer's. That's, that's a way to understand the crisis. And today in America, 19 million people are providing unreimbursed care uh, for an Alzheimer's uh, friend or family member. And so uh, what I would do is first invest uh, in cures in our lifetime. That's why that's so important to me, uh, is that we're not just talking about coverage, uh, but that we're challenging ourselves to find a cure. And most Alzheimer's patients are taking therapies that were used 10, 15, 20 years ago. So we're not seeing you know, the updates and innovation that we could if we invested in the cures. But I also believe as technology and automation and uh, artificial intelligence displaces people in their jobs, we have an opportunity for a care economy. So my mom, for example, she's uh, in her early 60s. She'd kill me for saying that publicly. But she works as an administrative assistant and she's worried that technology could displace her from the workforce and she still has seven to 10 years uh, working ahead of her. If people like her who are at the end of their career lose jobs to technology, I think there's an opportunity to train them six to eight week courses on how to provide care to someone who needs memory care or you know like a Parkinson's or Alzheimer's patient that would also reduce the cost and what the burden is uh, on the government today so there's opportunities here I think we just as I said need to go big on the issues be bold with the solutions and do good in the way that we treat each other and govern thank you thank you <laughs> thank you Heather next question comes from Mary Kirstein hello according to several sources the US is responsible for about 33 percent of worldwide arm armament sale if elected president would you um, decrease the US role in international arms sales yeah so I would first lead with treaties alliances and nuclear uh, weapon deterrence uh, so right now you see uh, we're increasing the arms sales that we're giving to other countries around the world and decreasing the way that we engage to try and find peace. Uh, you know, forgive me for this, but as a parent, you know, you think of everything in like a parental metaphor now. But if you were looking at our foreign policy landscape, like a parent looks at a playground, you will see over the last three years, your child has gone, out, gone from hanging out with the honor roll kids, like the Brits and the French and the Germans, to now we roll with the detention crew like the Russians and the Saudis and the Turks and selling a lot of weapons, uh, for example, uh, to the Saudis. And it's not just that we're keeping bad company. It costs us more at home. It costs us more at home when you don't have treaties. It costs us more at home when you can't count on NATO. It costs us more at home when we're not able to count on South Korea and Japan. And so what ends up happening is that takes money away from tablets for our kids and affordable medicine for our seniors. So to reduce the number of arms that are just out in the world, to reduce what we have to spend on our own defense, uh, I'll do what, what's hard, which is engage with our friends and strike uh, treaties with our enemies. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mary. Next question comes from social media and Ellen yeah. Silly. She asks, which one of the other Democratic candidates, in your opinion, represents the biggest threat to your campaign? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> I, you know, it, it's a growing, emerging uh, field. There, there are candidates uh, in this field uh, I've gone to weddings of some of the people who are running. And, and for me, you know, someone like me is not even supposed to be in Congress. My parents didn't know a congressman until I got elected. And so it, it is kind of uh, surreal for me that that's the case, to have friends in the field. Uh, but I just rest, I'm just i rest assured that no matter who emerges as the nominee, uh, we will have someone better than who is in the White House uh, today. You have friends that you plan to stay friendly in this oh, race, yeah. or are you going to yeah. draw contrast? Uh, I mean, we're, I'm going to stay friendly with them, but I'm going to lead with my values. And, and again, I think what makes me unique is that I'm a candidate who is a working class candidate and, and still paying off student loan debt today understands why people work hard and are frustrated that it's not adding up to more. 
I think I bring generational optimism as well, as, as well as geographical inventiveness, representing a district in Silicon Valley and seeing that investments in technology can bring down the cost and extend the quality of life in healthcare and the government just needs to be a part of that too. But also experience uh, of, you know, even though I'm 38 years old, having been in Congress uh, for seven years, particularly on the Intelligence Committee, I think those three uh, traits, uh, someone who has working class roots, generational optimism, experience, that allow me to get the job done on day one. Next question comes from Marie Mulroy. Hi, Marie. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for taking my question. I, and so this question is just basically, what is one thing as that, that you don't, that for, for voters that we don't know about you yet? Yeah, so one thing that I hope everyone gets to know about me is that I grew up in a town called Dublin, California. I moved and went to nine different schools and lived in 11 different homes before graduating uh, from high school. But stability for me was this town called Dublin. And I played soccer, I went to college on a soccer scholarship and I learned uh, pretty quickly when I got better and better at soccer uh, that uh, Dublin didn't have a competitive team so I had to play in another city's, uh, wear another city's mm. uniform uh, to go play soccer. And I learned that the nickname they had for us because it was a, a low income, uh, at times low expectations town, they called us Scrublin. And I, I hated that, that that's how people thought of us because we didn't have big employers, we didn't have you know, the big houses. So after law school, I came back home and I joined the Arts Commission and then the Planning Commission, started the Alumni Association for my high school and then got elected to the City Council. And I worked with leaders in the town to turn around that reputation and we invested in infrastructure. We built a new high school where when I graduated, a third of us went on to college. Mm -hmm. Today, 99% of nice. the students go to college. We even have a damn Whole Foods, which I think <laughs> is a sign <laughs> that you've made it. So I hope the whole country will learn the name Dublin, California, because if you can do that there, invest in infrastructure, invest in schools, attract development, you can do that anywhere of the disconnected communities in America. Thank you. One quick follow here. Yeah. Uh, other than Congress, you've held a few other positions in office. Yeah. Which one of those do you think provided the most instructive learning experience for becoming President of the United States? You know, it would be being a city council member in a city uh, especially during the economic downturn. We grew out of uh, the 2008 uh, downturn by making uh, investments, by having uh, ways that attracted businesses to come in, by returning their sales tax dollars to them if they invested in dilapidated uh, areas. And, and seeing a country that is disconnected in so many places where the people work hard and they've got grit and determination but they don't have infrastructure, I would want to apply that same uh, you know, manner of practice that we did in Dublin across America. All right, Congressman Swallow, thank we thank you for Thanks, your time Sarah. on yep. TV. We're going to continue thank this you. conversation online and on our mobile app. Next week, a colleague of yours, Congressman Seth Moulton, will be here. Went to his wedding. All right, there yeah. you go. <laughs> but you can join us on our mobile app, but for now that's a conversation with the candidate. Thanks for watching this evening. Thank you.